Good evening, grave robbers, and welcome back to the television graveyard. We are your TV necromancers, Laura Prince and Noah Houlihan, and we have come here tonight to examine the spirits of past television shows, find out which ones could be resurrected, should be resurrected, and which ones could stay doomed. This is a podcast in which we'll analyze the history, the hype, and the aftermath of shows that ran only one season or only one episode. With me, as always, is TV's Noah Houlihan. Ask yourself this. Is the impossible possible? We are doing the 2007 five-episode run of Phenomenon. Yes. This is ending Vegas week. Month. (laughs) Month. Inter... You good? Sporadic episodes because things got messed up because we lost power. Yeah. Uh, But we are finally doing Phenomenon. This is a show I've wanted to do for a while. I watched chunks of this live. Yeah. Uh, So uh, I was a big magic fan. I love magic. You are, yes. And uh, I was very excited to see who would be the next Phenomenon. This is basically American Idol Magicians. Yes. And... Absolutely as terrible as that implies. I mean, let me just start by saying, how good would this show have been if they started with open American Idol style auditions? Oh my gosh. Think Like people lined up around the block to do magic. For Yuri Geller and Chris, Chris Angel. Angel, and like half of them are blowing tricks and doing the I'm pulling my finger off thing. I, I genuinely do feel that the emphasis on a certain kind of trick hurt the show. So yeah, that's one of the things I really want to start out by talking about here. So the main concept is first and foremost... Uh, The two judges are Chris Angel, who if you don't know who Chris Angel is, welcome to the podcast. This is probably the first time you've been here. There's a whole episode on Chris Angel that you got to check out. Uh, He is an insane emo magician, uh, very uh, David Blaine in style, a lot of extreme tricks. Yuri Geller is a mentalist who actually contends that he has powers. Yes. That he is a mentalist with the ability to bend spoons. You know, if you ever played Pokemon and you see Kadabra and Alakazam with spoons, Mm -hmm. it's because of Yuri Geller. Because Yuri Geller used to bend spoons with his mind. Or if you're a big fan of the R.E.M. song, The Great Beyond... Where the third line is, I'm breaking through, I'm bending spoons, I'm keeping flowers in for bloom. I always think of that when somebody bends spoons, because it's one of my all-time favorite songs. It's a good song. Uh, So they are going to judge these phenomenons. Now, the thing is, no one, there's ten contestants. Yes. None of them say that they are magicians. No, they don't. They're all mentalists or paranormalists. Or, you know, that they have, they all contend that what they are doing is real to an extent. Yes. Which I find unethical. I find it makes the show kind of boring. Beyond the ethics of it, because I don't have a strong opinion about the ethics of it. Uh, Everything is the same kind of trick. Yes. It's all... You're going to say something I have no way of knowing, and I'm going to guess it. Yes. And that gets old. I will say, uh, I'm going to be playing Fool Us as we watch this. So I'm basically going to tell you, for almost every trick, how I think it was done. This is not me doing research and, you know, exposing things. This is me saying, like, if... I were to do this, this is what I would do to make that trick work the way it does. So... You know a lot more about magic than I do. Uh, That will actually come up because there will be one point where I point out 
the even I think I know how something was done. Yes. So <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I think I know what trick it is and I don't think you're right, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm very excited for this podcast. We are going to get into how this show works. We start with a warning that everything is going to be shown live. Yes. Which I think is very important for a magic show. Yes, and does a very important for any entertainment value the show maintains. Mm-hmm. Uh, because things can go wrong, and it adds that sense of danger. And things maybe do go wrong. Oh, yeah. Get excited. Uh, so, uh, our host is Vincent, uh, or I'm sorry, Tim Vincent. And uh, he can go right into our tier list of interchangeable white men that host reality shows. I found it super fascinating because he does not milk everything the way a general um, reality host does. Like, when he does the end the winner is, he'll be like, and the winner is Steve. Yeah, it seems like since everything's live, they tend to run long constantly. Yes. There's none of that. I, it's especially apparent in the finale that they were so afraid of running short that there was so much filler that they run long. Yeah, it's, it's very dumb. Uh, so in one of my favorite moments, uh, we start with uh, Tim Vincent going, Chris, what are you looking for in the next phenomenon? And Chris Angel spends three minutes talking about himself. Chris, what are you looking for in the next phenomenon? Well, I got to tell you, we've done over 900 demonstrations each and every week on my Mind Freak show. More hours of magic than any magician in U.S. primetime history. I'm here to get my mind blown. Yes. Incredible. Chris Angel, never change. He never will. And basically, this is going to work like American Idol. Uh, America will vote. You can vote up to 10 times on landline and 10 times uh, online for who you believe should be the phenomenon. There's something really charming about calling in to vote. Yes. Like, because it's 2007. Yeah. So texting is a thing, but it's not the preferred voting mechanism. Yeah. We're still at the time where, like, texting costs a dime. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Children, back in the day, texting cost 10 cents per text. Yeah. And I guess they're assuming you didn't a dollar want to vote for Steve. No. I'm using Steve as just a placeholder name. Yes. Uh, So let's get started with Ehun Sagat. So basically we're going to get four performances tonight. Yes. Two of these will go home on the next show. Uh... He does a trick where he demands the crowd be silent, which as a gimmick, I think is pretty good. Yeah. This is going to take multiple, uh, maximum focus. Uh, And (laughs) each episode has three um, celebrity guests who act as the the beautiful assistants. Yes. In this case, it is Carmen Electra, which is cool. And... He does this trick where Carmen Electra is standing with her eyes closed. And then he touches himself. Which right there, the Ugh. joke is so obvious. But Carmen Electra has her eyes closed and he touches himself on a certain area. And then he asks Carmen Electra, where did I just touch you? So he'll like touch his shoulder twice and then say... Carmen, where were you just touched? And she'd say, I felt two taps on my shoulder. Yeah. So, this is a trick. It's pretty impressive, in my opinion. Okay. But it all really depends on it being true that there has been no rehearsal. Because that's the thing they always say is like, there's been no rehearsal with our celebrity panel tonight. Yeah. Because the obvious way to do that... Is to just be like... Have a conversation. I'm going to touch my shoulder twice and you you act like you touch your shoulder. Yeah. Uh, Other than that, I really don't know how this trick is done. I think they have a conversation about it backstage. 
Yeah, like, other than that, which is like, which we're told it isn't, which we could just be being lied to. I don't know how that was done. We're being lied to. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I I know I'm a little cynical about it, but I, I genuinely kind of get the impression. After each trick, illusion, feat, what have you, uh, they get feedback from Chris Angel and Uri Geller. Yes. Uh, Uri Geller speaks a little bit more slowly and thoughtfully. Chris Angel, during this particular one, he name drops other people. Uh, he says persona, but he yeah. says persona. Persona. <laughs> like I have rhyming with Madonna. I thought you have a decent stage persona. I thought you looked like you had fun doing what you did. Uh, I just didn't feel that you were 100% committed to who you are in your mind, meaning that it didn't come beyond the bar. And I think you're setting the standard of what that bar is right now for the other performers. Your PK touch routine as a magician was average. Uh, I'm also a good friend and work with Banachek, who is one of the creators of that concept. So I, I'd like to see you come back next week, push your envelope as a, as a performer. And I, I found both judges to take more than they gave. Like, I, I didn't find either of the judges to really be constructive or interesting. Well, it's hard to give instruction on magic without talking about method. Yeah. Penn is great at that in Fool Us. He is. Where he'll kind of discuss stuff and slip in a few code words to the person who did the trick to see if, like, they can kind of have a conversation in front of us that like doesn't we get don't understand away. uh but because we're pretending like they're actually doing these things we we have to pretend that like oh your feet wasn't that great yeah which brings me to the next person and this is where i think things start to really turn to like oh wait a minute we're pretending like this is real with jim carroll Jim Carroll describes himself as a smuck steel worker. I'm just a regular guy that happens to be blessed with a, an ability that I have no idea where it comes from. I don't know how I do any of this stuff. I really, truly, truly don't. I'm just a schmuck steel worker laid off like everybody else. Who doesn't feel pain and doesn't know why. He just was kind of born this way. He's one punch man. Like, he's just like, this is how I am. This trick is awful. It's pretty funny to watch Ross the intern, though. Yes. Yeah, so Ross was from The Tonight Show. He was yeah. like a character on The Tonight Show. and I Ross forget, the intern. I forget who the other person. It's not Carmen Electra. It's the, the third person who is part of the group. I think it was like... Uh, Rachel Hunter. Rachel Hunter. They join him on stage for this trick, and he spends the first couple moments showing how strong a fox trap is. He sets up a fox trap, which is basically a small bear trap. Yes. And he puts a piece of wood in there, and it snaps it. Yeah. Then he opens it back up and grabs Ross's arm. Who's not into this. Who's not into this and is like, okay... As long as you believe in me, you'll be fine. And he starts pretending like he's going to stick his arm into this trap that just broke the wood. Uh, and he tries to get him to say, like, I, Ross, do not hold Jim Carroll or NBC responsible. And Ross is not having any Ross of Ross is not having any of this. So then he says, all right, fine, we'll do something else. Uh, he sends the other assistant to write down their favorite celebrity. Yes. And then they bring out another trap. And Jim Carroll sticks his arm in it. It snaps on it. And he goes, no pain. See, no pain. I feel no pain. The celebrity you wrote down is uh, Jeff Goldblum. What even was that? I, I don't know. He spent the first half giving credibility to this fox trap. That he then just gets rid of, never uses in the trick, gets his gimmicked bear trap that he never gives any credibility to, and sticks his arm in it. Yeah. 
And then the whole and thing... And no sells it. And then the whole thing of like, oh, that's Jeff Goldblum. Like, none of that means anything. This trick is terrible. <laughs> uh, and for some reason, the judges like it. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was weird and kind of lame. It was... That's because that's what it is. <laughs> um... Oh, my, my note is uh, Ross is better than this show. Yes. R- Ross is the standout star of this entire show. Ross is very fun. He's not in every episode, but everyone he's in, every, like, vert feat mm-hmm. he's involved in. Him and uh, Tia Carrera from Wayne's World. She's the other most fun guest host. Yeah. So, then Ari Geller does, like, A trick with symbols that doesn't quite read? Yeah, so he puts up the the normal uh, psychic symbols. Like when you're trying to predict what's on the other side of a a card, it's usually these symbols, which are a square, a star, a triangle, a circle, and some wavy lines. Yes. He tells us at home to pick one and then vote on NBC.com which one we picked. Yeah. And he was going to predict which one we picked. We'll get back to that later in the show. Uh, We then get our next uh, illusion... No. Mentalist. Feet. Uh, Stunt. It's Aaron Raven, which is a great name. Uh, He is going to play Nail Gun Roulette. And his mommy's here to watch. And his mom is in the front row, so they're constantly cutting to his mom like, ooh... She might have to watch her son die soon. Now, I will say, I do believe that she does not love this. Yeah. Uh, I don't think she's acting. I think she genuinely really hates being there and genuinely really hates this whole situation. Now, there are six nail guns, and he shows that the nail gun works. He takes out the, the like, round of nails, yeah. makes sure it's empty, and then asks the assistant... Load one of the nail guns. Yeah. And then I'm going to figure out which one is loaded and which one is not. Yeah, Carmen Electron loads a nail gun. Yes. So... Put your finger... My next note. Put your fingerprints all over each and every one of them. Yeah. (laughs) If I get shot, I want to be able to blame you. Uh, He's going to take each nail gun, put it to his head, to his temple, and pull the trigger. And then if he thinks it's loaded, he's not going to do that. So he's going to do it to all of them except for the loaded one. Laura, you then say, well, you can see if a nail gun's loaded. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, there has to be a safety feature on a nail gun that lets you see if it is loaded, or there has to be a weight difference. Yes. Now, that being said, uh, Penn and Teller do a nail gun trick that I love. He takes a loaded, like that strip that we saw of nails. Yeah. But they're not, it's not full. There's like blanks in it. So he's taking the nail gun, and whenever it's a nail, he hits a board. And whenever it's a blank, he hits his hand. And the idea is I have memorized when it's a blank and when it's a nail. So he's just kind of like talking, and he's hitting the nails, and he's hitting his hand, and he's hitting the nails. And he's doing this big, long explanation. And then he hits the board, and a nail doesn't come out. And he stops and like stares at it for a moment. And he's like, okay. Bop, 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 bop. And he like runs through it again. And he creates that tension of like, oh, he's lost in the pattern. Yeah. And then he does a few more like, he's like, okay, I think I got it. And he puts one in his hand and it's not a nail. And he goes through all the rest of them. And he looks at the audience and says, you know, are you impressed? Uh, and they say like, they cheer. And he goes, Okay. If you thought that there was ever a chance that I was going to put a nail through my hand and he walks over to Teller and he puts it against his head and pulls the trigger and goes, you know nothing about magic. And that's him saying, like, I've created the tension for you that you thought something awful might happen. Yeah. And now I'm letting you know it was an impossibility. Everyone was safe the whole time. And 
It does nothing to damage the trick in no. doing that. But this show completely removes that aspect. Can I tell you a tangentially related story? Of course you can. When I was about seven years old, I went to Universal Studios uh, because I wanted to go to Nickelodeon Studios because that's how old I am. So my parents took me to Universal Studios when we went to Florida to visit my grandparents. And I was scared of everything. I didn't like King Kong. I didn't like Jaws. Uh, I was, I acted out so much on Jaws. People thought I was in fact uh, paid to be there. And then we went on Earthquake. Earthquake at that time ended with you still being on the subway car, but the ride resets in yep. front of you. And not only did I not get scared once I saw that, I told my parents I wish we'd gone on that ride first. Because I would have enjoyed everything more. I was a very self-aware kid, which yeah. is like, sounds like I'm retroactively making stuff up about a seven-year-old, but I was this weird I was like, I would have liked this more if I'd known it was all pretend. And I knew yeah. I was safe. Mm -hmm. And the only ride I remember not being scared of was Back to the Future. Because it was after? Because I, no, because I knew it was like VR. Oh, okay. I knew, like, cause, because it was the screens, mm -hmm. I knew it was pretend and it was fun. So I, I remember, that. It, it, that's what that reminds me of. It was like, the ride can make the tension. I'm an adult now. I know... That these rides aren't real. Right. But the ride's supposed to make me think it is for a second while I'm still really safe. Yeah. Teller was never in danger. Exactly. Uh, so then, uh, Aaron does this trick. Guess what? He doesn't put any nails into his head. His mother is worried but happy. And... Uh, I would say that this is probably the the best trick of the night in that it's exciting and different and stuff happens. Tim Vincent's like, what do you think? And Chris Angel talks about himself again. Yes. Well, I want to applaud NBC for allowing a demonstration like this on because I did the ultimate demonstration with a real gun. And I know what's at stake and I applaud you for doing it. Uh, I think it was the most dramatic thing of the evening. I think it was uh, a very nice presentation, very strong. I, Chris Angel always just kind of goes back to talking about himself in every version of this. And then uh, then we meet Jerry. Yes, we meet Jerry. Uh, Jerry uh, McCambridge is our final uh, mentalist of the night. Uh, he does a trick with a phone book. Yeah. And basically, he has... Uh, someone in the audience randomly pick out a phone book. He's got like a bunch of phone books out there. He's like, pick one of these. The person picks it. And then uh, another person in the audience who I forget how they randomly did it. I think maybe something was thrown uh, is picked and goes, all right, pick a page number. So they pick a page number and he takes a piece of paper and starts scanning down the page and asks his assistant uh, to say stop at any time. Yeah. He said stop, and they stop on a phone number. And they say, okay, I want you to read this phone number out, but we can't give away someone's phone number on TV, so just include two blanks in there somewhere. So she picks out this phone number, and she says, like, blank, and then the numbers, and then another blank at the end. Yeah. On stage is a per are people holding envelopes. Seven people holding envelopes. He tells the people who with the blanks, like, we're not going to use you. But everyone else that was said, pull out the numbers and see if they match. Oh, my God, they match. And they say, and also to our two blank people, open up your envelopes. And the blanks are in there, too. Yeah. Which is a, it's a decent trick. He's a little dull and flat. In his presentation. Yeah, he doesn't have, like, a lot of sparkle. But as a trick, it's pretty good. My guess of what is happening is every phone number on every page in every phone book was that number. 
Yeah, the, I it's believe, trick phone book. I believe that the way that he did that is when he was scanning down the page, he actually had like a little device over the rest of the pages so that she couldn't see all the other numbers. Mm. So she couldn't see that the same number was given every time. Huh. There's also a, the way she says blank implies she is reading blank, mm. not not choosing to leave a blank. Stop. Right there. Take the peek. What are the first three digits above my finger? Forget the area code. Give one of them a, yeah. it's a blank. Blank three, two. Blank three, two. Let's let Ross catch up. Yes. How are we doing, Ross? Great, thanks. Good. Okay. Give them a the next nervous, four digits, but... but leave one out. Two, five, nine, blank. Two, five, nine, blank. How do we do, Ross? Chris Angel kind of gives him the business and says that it wasn't that good of a trick and uh, sends him away. And we're told that we can vote for these four magicians. And before we go, we got to think which symbol won the poll. What's great is you and I... Well, Chris Angel tells him to, like, do better. Yes. And um, you and I pick different symbols. Yes. Which tells you that the trick just can't guaranteed work. So it was just pick it random. Like, it wasn't one of those math ones where it's like, start here, move your finger one spot. And, like, mathematically, you always end up on the same thing. It was a random choice. But... Uh, Yuri says, I predict that most people will pick the star, and the star was the most picked. Yeah. With 28%. There were five choices. It won with 28%. Which really, you had a one in five chance of picking the right one. That only won by 8%, really. Yeah. (laughs) So, most people this did not work for. And uh, uh, James Randi, who is a stage magician and skeptic. Oh, yes. I love Randi. Uh, he said that, like, you just pick the one that statistically audiences pick the most. Yes. Like, it's just statistics. Yes. Uh, there, Because there's a, a trick that I do sometimes. I'll do it for you now. You can, do, you can leave this in the comments down below. Ooh. Uh, think of a number between 1 and 100. Uh but make it a two-digit number and make both, uh, make both digits odd, okay? Two-digit number, most make both digits odd, all right? Mm-hmm. Mm, using powers, using powers. You have picked 37. <laughs> nope. Uh, there's a good chance that a lot of you also picked 35, but I'm getting more 37s from my powers, then I am getting 35s. What did you pick? What, like 13? 57. 57. That's rare. Like ketchup. Oh, cool. Uh, so <laughs> it makes, I'm making the illusion that I'm picking a random number out of one from 100. I just have a 1% chance to do this. Yeah. I'm really only picking out of like 20 numbers because I've gotten rid of the single digit numbers and 100. I've gotten, so I'm down to 90. Yeah, you got rid get, of all even numbers. Yeah, so I get rid of half, and then I get rid of, uh, so that brings me to 45. I get rid of another half, because it's the... Uh, all the 20s, all the 40s, all yes. the 60s, all the 80s. And then I get uh, rid of all of the doubles. Did I say that? That's also supposed to be part of it. Pick different digits. I don't think you did. Yeah, that's another part. Of it. Like, but you're still getting rid of uh, four, four, uh, five more numbers. Yes, yeah, I'm getting more rid of more numbers, so I'm raising my things. And the way that our minds work is when you think of an odd number, for some reason you usually skip one. So you, huh. don't, you usually don't answer with a teen, so you think of a 30 first, and then you either think of a 35 or a 37. It'll It's a statistic thing. Yep, and I... Uh, you've actually... You've done this before... With, yeah. the, like, off mic. And I can never remember what the number is supposed to be. And I never get the right one. You never pick the right number. Because I think... I had the thought of don't pick 73. You always pick 73. So I was like, 57. Nope, still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because usually, because you read left to right, you pick a lower number than a higher number. Usually. <laughs> like, that's just how our minds work. 
<laughs> because you run through numbers sequentially. Unless you're me and you ruin stuff. I mean, you picked 57, which is still true. The, but my first instinct was 73. Oh. Right. Because my first instinct is, I'm gonna wreck it. <laughs> yeah, see? So, episode two. Yes, episode two. Uh, there's a very interesting thing that I want to start with. Okie dokie. The host says we have some great uh, performers, one of which who can talk to the dead. Yeah. I find that suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Because a lot's going to happen with that particular performer. I think it's very interesting that it's brought up in the first moment. Uh, Raven Simone's here. Raven Simone, that is so, so Raven. It made me happy. Um, they don't lean on that as much as I kind of wish they did. But they Raven don't. Simone is there. Yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't Raven out at any point. It would have been cool if they like had her do a trick or a bit. Well, it's also important to note that it's also Halloween. Yes, and I believe this was like a two-hour special. Because there's so much crap in this episode. Yeah. And on top of that, the first episode was four magicians. This one, ha- or mentalists. This one has six. So they're going to need the, the extra time. We start by... So before we find out who's eliminated, each of the magicians do like a quick trick. Yeah, they're so quick that I actually don't even have them. Okay, because the one that I want to talk about, it starts with Jim Carroll... Talking to one of the celebrities, not Raven Simone. Shandy? Probably Shandy. Because the other one's Ross in this episode. Yeah, so it's not Ross. you would have known if it was Ross. Uh, and goes like, I want you to pick a card. Think of any card in this deck. And she goes, all right, two of hearts. And then she he shoots the cards at her chest. And he goes, did it. Check inside your dress. And she reaches in between her chest and pulls out the two of hearts. This is not a magic trick. Like, I, I want to bring up this trick. Yeah, I have a note. Like, she's a plant, but this is still gross. Yeah, because if you're a fan of plus two wrestling, Scott Holiday, my alter ego, does this exact magic trick. Where basically, he makes something appear in a thing that is never shown to be empty. Mm. So how can that be considered impressive if you've never been shown that it is an empty vessel? And it's a thing that, like, well, they're like, well, we can't show that it was an empty vessel. It was her chest. And it's like, well, yeah, that's that's kind of the point we're making is it's clearly... <laughs> this trick is clearly fake. Yes. Uh, the other tricks, I don't have anything really to say about them. Other tricks happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have, like much about it. Because it not only do we see the previous magicians, we're going to see all the magicians or mentalists that are performing throughout the whole thing. Uh, I liked how the female, how Angela, who's our female illusionist, introduces herself. She does a little trick with a ring. Yes. That uh, she hits with a hammer and nothing happens to the ring. And then she just crushes it in her fingers. And makes a point about, like, if you believe anything is possible. Yeah. And it's a good, showy introduction. It's the only one I really have down here. Because I could actually, like, remember it. Yeah, it was probably the most, like, interesting of all of them. Jim uh, Callahan, uh, who will be important later, does one where he says, like... Ladies and gentlemen, before the show started, I asked Shandy to think randomly of a p- place, a person, or a thing. That's in your mind. I told her I would be reading her mind. I didn't tell her that the entire United States would be reading her mind also, because when I read somebody's mind, it se- sort of pulses out. So you're going to take part in this. Shandy, think of it now. It's in your mind. It's a dead person, isn't it? Yeah. It is. A de- well, that's wow. appropriate for me. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> um, think of- it's a singer, right? Everybody think of the first dead singer that comes to your mind. Shandy, write it on your slip. Ladies and gentlemen, raise your hand. This is what you thought of Shandy. What do you have? The audience <laughs> and the United States read her mind. Wild and thunderous applause. You usually think of Elvis first, if you do that. 
Yeah. And it was Elvis. And I, again, I didn't. Who did you think of? Uh, well, first I went Michael Jackson, but I knew Michael Jackson hadn't died yet. Yeah. In time. So, after Michael Jackson, I went, John Lennon? Hmm. Because I, that was just where I thought of. Yeah, that makes sense. Kurt Cobain, something like that. Yeah, so I, all this to say I've literally, I guess, never picked the correct one. That's and I true. never do through this no. entire series. I never pick the one I'm supposed You're to pick. You're difficult. <laughs> so uh, then we get down to uh, the eliminations. Yes. The uh, four magicians that we saw, mentalists that we saw perform in the, the first episode are on stage. And we're going to announce who's gone. And the- First, Aaron with the nail gun is declared safe. Yes. This, they do kind of milk this a little bit where they call someone forward and they don't let them know if they're eliminated or not. Yeah. Uh, so Aaron is declared safe. Next it is Ehud who is eliminated. He's the one that did the magic touch with Carmen Electra bit. Yeah. Uh, then they save uh, Jerry, who's the one that did the phone number thing that nobody liked. Yeah. And then Jim Carroll, the bear trap person, is eliminated. Yeah. And guess what, gang? Noah did some research. Noah did, Noah did, Noah did some research. Oh boy. So let's talk about what happened to these two uh, mentalists after they were eliminated from Phenomenon. Ehud still goes by the moniker The Mentalizer. You can go on his website... Uh, where you can book him for various events, or if you want to learn how to be a mentalist, you can buy his DVD for just $20 called Be a Phenomenon. That is false advertising, if I ever heard one, because he was the first person out of Phenomenon. Yeah, you're literally the first. How to be... The tenth in phenomenon out of ten. And then Jim Carroll. Hey, Laura. Jim Carroll look familiar to you? Don't Google. <laughs> I, I can't remember what he looked like. He was the bald one that did the uh, the bear trap one. Faintly. Oh, okay. Uh, Jim uh, still talks about how he's basically a mentalist, not that he's a, a magician. He... Does a lot of memory tricks now. Okay. Uh, he believes that, or he uh, basically brags that he knows pi to a thousand digits. He's memorized over 80,000 zip codes. And you can give him any date and he'll tell you what day of the week it is. Which is like a common, like, I had a friend in school who could do yeah. that, yeah. Uh, he also really got good at the art of card throwing. So much so that he appears in the film... Jackass number two as the professional card oh. thrower that throws cards at Wee Man, even though they don't actually do that, they just electrify his stool. So that's Jim Carroll. So I do want to point out you asking me, did he look familiar to you? We had had an entire off mic conversation about how they all kind of looked similar and it made it very challenging to tell them apart. Yes. So when you're like, did he look familiar to you? I was like, I don't know. Well, yeah, that's true. I, I say, also, I'm not great with faces. Yeah. You know this. Like, I, I do not recognize faces easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I was like, no. Do you look familiar to you? No, but no. <laughs> uh, also, I should note that a surprisingly large number of the contestants are from Pennsylvania. Yeah. There's something in the water. Yeah. <laughs> Jim Carroll being one of those. Uh, so, now we're off to... We, we send... Pennsylvania's main export is magicians. Is magicians and, and uh, well, mentalists. They actually have supernatural powers, Lara. And uh, and also uh, pogo sticks. Remember how we found out that all the professional pogo stickers were from Pennsylvania? Yes, we were watching the Ocho one. Because mm-hmm. uh, that's my favorite summer tradition at this point, is ESPN just one day does the Ocho. Yeah. And, yeah, they were all disproportionately from, like, a similar part of Pennsylvania. Yes. <laughs> and I love that. Uh, so our two surviving magicians get the rest of the night off. 
the eliminated magicians get to go cry. And we're going to learn about our new magicians. And our first one is Wayne Hoffman. I dislike Wayne Hoffman in this show. Mm -hmm. Um, My notes, literally, it's a quote from him, then, ew. Uh, A quote from him, and no, no, no. Uh, He says things like, I get in their heads and mess with them. I get a thrill out of it. Then, ew. I I would be a little mischievous and get their phone numbers. Gross. Um, he just comes off sleazy. Yes. And Laura hates this guy. However, I kind of have a different feeling about this. That's nice. This is when I realize, oh, right. This is a reality show. They're making him the sleazeball character out of all of them. Oh. And like, it didn't dawn on me until this moment. I was like, oh, of course it's a reality show. Everybody has to have like different personalities. So I personally believe that he was brought in to be kind of the sleazeball of the group. Uh, you can still not like him. I did not. But I think his uh, illusion or mentalism is one of the best that we'll see. He invites uh, a volunteer on stage and tells her to draw a picture. And he uses some like fancy phrases like, don't let me influence you. I don't want any anger coming at us, at me for this. Uh, You know, draw whatever you like. And he reveals that before the show started, he got a tattoo as a prediction of what was going to be drawn. And he reveals that the tattoo he got was a yin-yang, and the drawing that she made was a yin-yang. Right. But they all, he also does this great thing where he goes, he gives a plausible explanation where he says, the way that I did this is I said, I don't want any influence, any influence yeah, he, like, leans on things that he didn't really yeah. super lean on when he was speaking. Yeah. I don't want there to be any anger and yanger. And, like, he doesn't lean on it when he actually says it, but, like, letter-wise, any anger, yeah. yang is in there. Uh, and then they cut backstage. He was like, this table was in your dressing room. And it's, like, a black and white table with stones on it that yeah. make a yin-yang. Is that how he did it? Absolutely not. But... The idea of him creating this plausible narrative around this, where it's like, because I did X, Y, and Z, you did A, B, and C, I think is pretty good. Uh, In terms of how the trick's actually done, logical answer is staged. Uh, If it's not that, I have no idea how he did it, and I'm very impressed. But it probably is that. (laughs) Yeah, I just... His persona made me so uncomfortable because it, like, most of his skeeziness was directed toward women. Oh, yeah. It was very much like mystery from uh, the pickup artist. And very I just... same vibes. I just couldn't get over that. Mm-hmm. Like, had I been watching this, I would have actually picked up my phone to vote for literally anyone else. Understandable. Uh, um, he, his character is not... Very enjoyable. No. Uh, It's creating this picture of just like, yeah, women are toys that I can like bend using my superior power. Yeah. And that's not great. No, he was gross. I didn't like him. So then we move on to our only female competitor. Yes. I'm going to say speaking of gross, not because she's gross, but because the way she is spoken to throughout this competition is gross. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So she... Does a trick of essentially knife roulette. She stands up a knife in a base and then has Ross, like, three card Monty, well, like, five card Monty, where the knife base is. Yes, there's basically five bases. One has a knife, and she's going to slam her de- head, hand down through these, like, paper towers that where she doesn't know where the knife is. So, Ross is... The assistant for this. And throughout this entire trick, she's very kind to him. Yes. And it's 
It's actually, like, very endearing. Mm-hmm. Because we've kind of seen, especially Ross, kind of get treated like a butt monkey. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to, like, Ross hates everything about this. Uh, my notes include Ross dislikes this, Ross hates this, Ross does not like being here. <laughs> um... <laughs> I do like the last one where she does fake Ross out. Where she yes. faints toward the one with the knife. Yeah. But then slams her hand down on the empty one. Because mm-hmm. you watch the fear of God in Ross's eyes for a minute. Oh, yeah. She's an amazing performer. Because after she hits that last one, she bursts into tears. Yeah. Like, she's really good. It was just very funny when she fakes Ross out and you just see Ross like... Oh no. Um so Uri says you're as good as they are. <laughs> Which one of your all-time favorite Saturday Night Live sketches is what's the name? You <laughs> what's that name? And would you when he asks John Mulaney's character, Doug, what would you say to the young girls watching? I don't know. Uh, you're as good as any man. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. That's all I could think of. <laughs> oh, Terrible. Like, you're as good as they are. It's like, that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be whether she can be as good as they are. It's whether she is a good mentalist on her own mm-hmm. merits. Unfortunately, the next thing is you projected your sex appeal and your sensuality. She didn't <laughs> she wasn't trying to be sexy in this i i think there is an element they're conflating that she's nice to ross with her flirting with ross my next note is anger and then my next note and i have to say this is chris angel goes the days of girls and leotards being shoved in a box are over <laughs> i'm sorry did you listen to a couple episodes ago when we talked about your show? Your show literally started with a girl being, like, burlap sacked and taken away. Ah! It's why I will always like Fool Us more. Yes. Because Fool Us does not do the weird gendered crap. No. Ugh. We got a lot to get through here. <laughs> don't, don't get too exasperated here. The next thing we have is a man who is going to stop his heart by sheer will alone. Yes. Which and Brennan Lee Mulligan does on a particularly memorable game changer. Yes. I will be dead by the end of this episode. I will stop my heart. Uh, first off, uh, when she says a guy, that is his name. His name is Guy. Yes. Uh, oh, one quick thing about Angela that you kind of like brushed over before we get into this man who dies on stage. Yeah. Uh, Angela's last name? Fulovitz? <laughs> like, That's I, great. I couldn't find if it was real or not, but Angela Fulovitz is a great magician name. It's a, when it's a mentalist name and you actually have supernatural powers, it's the worst name. But for a magician, fantastic. That's pretty funny. So let's talk about Guy stopping his heart. Uh, basically, what he claims is going to happen is they are going to hook up a heart monitor to him. And while that's happening, Raven Simone (laughs) and uh, the other volunteer that's not Ross are going to be taking his pulse. It's actually a nurse. Oh, a nurse. It's They do this a lot in this show. They have medical personnel on standby to like really sell the whole thing. So it's, it's Raven Simone and it's a nurse. And a nurse are going to be taking his pulse while this like EKG machine monitors his heartbeat. Uh, and he says that basically there's an electronic charge in his heart that's what keeps it pumping. I'm going to shut that down. We have uh, medical physicians nearby to defibrillate me if, uh, if need be, if yeah. I can't restart my heart. If you shut down the charge in your heart, Defibrillation doesn't do anything. For in order for a defibrillator to work, that charge has to still be there. Huh. If that charge is gone, unfortunately, you are dead. So, it might sound like I'm nitpicking, but it's fundamentally against the thing that he's claiming to do. <laughs> yeah. 
to remove the charge that's in your heart. Uh, this I am defibrillator trained. That's why I know that. I am also AED trained. Um, uh, so then uh, he sits there and stops his heart, which is not good for TV. Uh, but you see the machine kind of slow down. Yeah. And then Raven Simone like jumps out out of fear because she no longer feel fears feels the pulse. She doesn't jump at that point. She just says she does. She doesn't jump until he moves again. Right. That's when she's like, blah. But like he kind of goes limp for a moment and then comes back and jump scares the crap out of Raven Simone. Yes. This is a very old trick that you can get in basically any magic book. Yeah. Uh. The machine I would propose is gimmicked and just not real. For sure. Uh, but the way you trick Raven Simone, the way that you do that, all you need to do this is a rubber ball. Okay. You take a rubber ball and you put it in your armpit. And when you squeeze it, it cuts off a certain artery and your pulse no longer makes it to your wrist. Huh. If, if you feel like... If you stick your thumb in your armpit and, like, kind of squeeze, you'll feel your pulse. Like, grab your arm. Like, you'll feel your pulse there. And that all you're doing is cutting that off so it no longer reaches your, uh, your wrist. Huh. That's the whole trick. And, like, it's pretty impressive for Raven. To everyone else, it's like, uh, it's a guy sitting in a chair for a minute. Yep. It's pretty boring. I think uh, this is dumb. Yeah, it, it was not. They also, there's also a really weird moment where they ask, what's it like being dead? And he responds, it's like being in a nightmare. This time it was like dogs. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> So I just took that that he went to hell and Cerberus was there. Puppy! That is the wrong takeaway, but okay. Next we have... Uh, oh my god. Jan Barty. Jan Barty. Who is a Belgian. Yes. Uh, he loves kissing people's hands, and I find it really creepy. He's middle-aged and European, so I, yeah. I kind of like... I was like, it's quirky... Honestly, after Wayne, he doesn't look that bad. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so he, everybody in the audience has their own matchbox. And they tell the audience to remove most, but not all of the matches. So now everybody in the audience has just got a pocket full of matches. Yeah. Like one does. Yeah, just full of matches. And Shandy has to decide randomly what the number of the matchbox he needs to find is. Because all the matchboxes have numbers on them. Yeah, so they're after everyone takes the matches out, uh, they throw that at, they throw them at him. Yeah, he just says, goes, throw them at me. And they just all yeet them at him. Uh, yeah, so now they're just all over the stage. So this is very, like, random. Uh, I forget how they choose which box he has to... To find. How they choose? Yeah. Uh, Shandy just chooses it. Shandy just chooses a random number? Yeah. Okay. And writes it down and puts it in her pocket. And he finds it with like a pendulum. Right. And then he has to also guess the number of matches in the box. Mm -hmm. And he knows it's five. Leading Shandy to yell, you're like Rain Man with matches. Kids, I don't think Shandy's seen Rain Man. No, I don't think so. That has literally nothing to do with Rain Man. (laughs) Rain Man, like, that's about counting cards. It's also about counting matches. Have you not seen Rain Man? It's not about mentalism. Yeah, but there's a whole part where they spill the box of matches, and he he looks at it, and he goes, uh, 450, or he goes, 497. Yeah. And Tom Cruise is like, how many are uh, in the in a set of matchbox? He goes five hundred, and he goes, "Ah, you were close." And then as they're walking away, the girl says, "There's three left in the box." Yeah, but that's not—it's not mentalism. No, no like, 
you're like Rain Man. No. <laughs> Raymond's able to, or not Raymond, Charlie's able to count to 497 instantly. Yes. Jan could count to five. To five, yes. Uh, so this is another. I was right. It was a Ra- it was Raymond Babbitt, Charlie's Tom Cruise. This is another trick that I know uh, exactly how he did it. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, the number that is chosen is a force. Uh, he forces her to pick two hundred fifty-seven. Okay. I forget exactly how that force happens, but it's forced uh, when everyone throws the matches at them. That creates enough cover on the stage that he can slip that matchbox out of his shoe. Okay. So that's loaded in his shoe, and he knows exactly how many matches are in there. Okay. So that's how that's done. Uh, The big giveaway, and this is just a little thing if you want to play Fool Us at Home and you're trying to figure out how magicians do things. He says, here's the box, 256. And then she corrects him. 257. The pendulum says, this is the box we seek. Please, you pick it up and show the number to the camera. 256. 57. 257. And what was the number you chose? 256. 257. And he goes, oh yes, right. And looks at it and goes, 257. That little bit of a mistake makes it look like it's not pre-planned. Okay. Because by flubbing the thing that he already knows is 100% true, it creates a bit of credibility that there was some sort of randomness involved and he didn't know already ahead of time that the number was going to be 257. Uh, Now that I think about it, I think it was like a math problem that that was the... uh, But we never actually see it. Okay. He's just writing it. I think some sort of math problem that leads to this and that's always the answer. Uh, so yeah, that's how he does it. It's a pretty good trick, but I know how that one was done. And then we get Jim Callahan. Jim Callahan. Paranormist Jim Callahan. And he's a duo. He's with Raymond Hill. Raymond Hill is a ghost that helps him do magic. I would love to correct you on that, but unfortunately, that is legitimately exactly right. Yes. Jim mentions that Raymond died years ago and that he's been reincarnated many times. He's just one of the most aware spirits he's ever encountered. And now he's just bored and helping this guy try to win money. Uh, yeah, so now they do they do magic shows together. Uh, so, this, this, is, this is great. Uh, he sits in a chair to commune because he we see a video of him explaining the trick because he's already started to commune with yes uh, Raymond yes so basically he has to let Raymond enter his body so that he can commune with him uh, and he explains that Raven Simone has chosen from a hundred objects one object, and has placed it in a box full of salt. Yeah. So that Raymond can see it and communicate this back to Jim, who is going to do writing with his non-dominant hand. This way, Raymond can take control of it and put this and give him this information. So while a video of Raymond explaining... or not Raymond. Raymond's the ghost. A video of Jim is explaining all this. Jim is on stage... In a circle of salt. Like, being possessed? Yeah. Gentle listeners. Some of you, I assume, by virtue of listening to this podcast, may have seen the 1990s pro shot of Jekyll and Hyde starring David Hasselhoff. That's the vibe. It's confrontation from Jekyll and Hyde, but like, specifically David Hasselhoff. It's kind of funny. It's really funny. It's very funny. It's it's hilarious. Uh, so he starts communing. He starts making like these scribbles 
all this stuff is happening. And then, like, he breaks communication. So he, like, falls out of the chair, breaks the circle of salt. And then is like, Raven, for the first time, reveal what's in the box. And it's like a mid-size model car. Yeah, it's just, it, it's a, a little car. and I About the size of a rather large cell phone. Yeah, it's like bigger than like a matchbox. Yeah. Car. Uh, it's bigger than that. And uh, Raven goes, a car is a little orange one. And uh, Raven goes, or not Raven, I'm sorry. Jim is like, look, look at the writing. And it's gibberish. And he goes, sometimes it's easier to read in a mirror. And he holds it up to a mirror and it says, uh, metal rectangle, four wheels. Yeah. So basically the idea is Raymond can see it, but can't quite like say exactly what it is. So he's just kind of like making out shapes and material, but he can't be like, it's a truck. Yeah. So he gives that information. And a very exhausted Jim Callahan goes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I posit to you, how do you think this was done? We don't really have any proof that they didn't look in the box. We really just always have their word that they don't look in the box. This is true. Uh, That's not how I believe it was done. That they just, I, I, taking away the idea that they're just cheating. That Raven just told him or that he looked in the box or things like that. Uh, I have a theory on how this is done. Sure. I have, I, two, I have two. Ma- magic's not really... I haven't studied magic a lot. So my Occam's razor is that he just knew it was in the box. Okay. Uh, one, they specifically say uh, she picked from a hundred objects. Yeah. Did you see any of the objects she chose from? No, that was a thing I had actually thought of, of like, were they all cars? Well, I think they were, because I think it's very odd that Raven says, Raven, (sighs) what did you put in the box? A little toy car, an orange one. It's a toy car, the orange one. Implying there were a bunch of different colored cars and oh. that were her only options. The second way I think this is done is that uh, Raymond the ghost uh, possessed his body after finding out what it was and told Jim Callahan how to do this. Those are two equally valid methods for how this was done. So Uri Geller kind of just gives it the like, Ah, it's controversial, but it was convincing. Chris Angel, however. (laughs) Chris Angel's a little less happy about this. I have my notes say, Angel takes a big old poopy on this one. Chris Angel goes, I will give you a million dollars of my personal money right now if either one of you can tell me specific details of what's... Now, don't tell me about the energy or that it's not the right time, but just tell me what's in here right now. And it turns into a fight. Now, they act like Jim's going to strike Chris Angel. But Jim's hands are behind his back the whole time. Yeah. Like, he's he's doing that thing where he pushes your, your chest out. He's kind of hoping Chris Angel decks him. Yeah. Which is not going to happen. Uh, he screams that Chris Angel is an ideological bigot. Ideological bigot, yeah. That, yeah. that gets it a bunch and you can hear for a moment you just hear oh i'm sorry <laughs> which i thought was so funny guys 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 you can't 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 you can not we never get to see what Ross, Raven, and Shandy look like. Yeah, we which never I get to see what I wanted. <laughs> I wanted Ross just like, oh. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on this fight? Because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this fight now. I, I think it was a desperate Hail Mary. Because the show, to this point, is kind of boring. 
So that was my first question is, do you think it's staged? Yes. Do you think it's just a staged fight? You do? I do. Okay. Uh, because no one, like... I'm a big fan of the VH1 of loves. Mm-hmm. People move quick when they want to fight. <laughs> and there's cameras. Like, you ever seen one of the reunion shows of one of those of loves? People are quick. I mean, I don't think... What you, when you say that, like, they would be too quick to break them up, or... they would the, Somebody would have gotten something in. Oh, because I don't think either of them wanted to throw a punch, based on what happened. I think they wanted to yell at one another. But basically, Chris Angel's being like, everything you're doing is bullcrap on but, national television. Yeah, it seemed weird to do, because it seemed like a weird line to draw. Because all of it has been... Egg... Exactly. I remember watching this live. It, this seemed fake. And my first thought was, why are we signaling out Jim Callahan? Every single person on stage claimed to have supernatural powers. He's just doing it in a more unique way, saying that it's his ghost friend doing it. Unlike Jim Carroll, who said... I don't know how I got these powers, but I no longer feel pain. Why is it that he's the person that gets singled out? Now, Chris Angel says things like, uh, I just don't like anyone that claims that they can communicate with the dead for, uh, like, to scam people. Okay. And my initial thought to this was, does Chris Angel not know it's a magic show? Because when I first watched this, I was like... Does Chris Angel know where he is right now? I was like, yeah, it's his act. Leave the guy alone. That's clearly his act. And you know who else claims to be able to talk to the dead? Yuri Geller. Yeah. The other judge on this show. Who I will say... Just kind of goes like, oh, this was controversial, but convincing. Like, Uri Geller does not get himself involved. Yeah. Uri Geller does not get involved at any point in this fight. Even when Chris Angel tries to bring it up in a later episode, Uri Geller stays out of it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. No, it did. No, it did. No, it did. Some research. I did a little bit more research. Uh-oh. I think... I think I agree with Chris Angel. Okay. I still think this is staged, so go on. So I found a video of the three of them discussing this that was put out by NBC on the NBC website as like an extra. Okay. Uh, Yuri Geller's the first one to talk, and he says, uh, I don't think Chris should have done that, but, you know... I'm glad that this happened on the show I created. He's Chris Angel, and when I brought him in, I brought him in to be like this live wire. So I'm glad that it happened. So then I was like, oh, this is Yuri Geller's show. Okay. That's an important little note. We then see Chris Angel, and Chris Angel says, the reason I did this is, (laughs) and I'm not saying I agree with Everything he says here. But he says, if you have the power, then use the power to tell me what's in this envelope. And if you do have the power to see things like that, where were you on September 10th? Why didn't you stop 9-11? That's treason. And I was like, there's a big difference between looking in a box and seeing the future. But okay, Chris Angel. And uh, there's an interview with uh, Jim Callahan moments afterwards. He's backstage. He calls Chris a bigot again and basically says, like, he came in here prepared to do this. Uh, He had notes in his pocket because he can't talk without having someone write it for him. And he came in here just to attack me. And he's refusing to let me respond. Let's do a debate. Let's do a debate. And I promise you I'll shut him down. This debate never happens. So I decide I'm going to reach out to Jim Callahan. 
Oh my god. So I was like, let me see if I can find Jim Callahan. And I did. I found his website. It's like jimclass.com, which ha. Uh-huh. Uh it's a relic from 2006. A lot of it doesn't work because I don't have Flash Player. <laughs> but he's offering a million dollars to anyone who is willing to be part of his show after you die. I guess he had a falling out with Raymond and he (laughs) needs a new ghost now. That's what it said on his website. And I was like, oh, wait. Oh, wait a minute. (laughs) I thought you were in on the joke. And now you're like, no, I talk to dead people and they tell me where cars are. I, I'd i really like to hear Raymond's side of the story, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, I, I, I reached out to Raymond. I sat in a circle of salt and I wrote with... Uh, backwards with your left backwards hand. Backwards with my left hand. Yo, what happened? You okay? And uh, I put it up to a mirror and it was a uh, cash app. And it said, uh, interviews, $20 a minute. So we shut down our Patreon. We can't afford Raymond anymore. Uh, so <laughs> that part's a bit. And we all know it's a bit. But if you go to Jim's website, you can sign up now to be his ghost partner. <laughs> Well, I was going to save that for the end, but uh, that seemed uh, pretty prescient to bring out now. Plus, I think this is leading into two-parter territory. I think so. you're right, because we have a lot to cover, and mm. we've been at this for nearly an hour already. Yes. So, unfortunately, there's still a lot of show after this. Yeah, and there's still a lot of episode two after this. Yeah, is what I'm saying. Uh, uh, we The next thing we get... Is we watch Chris Angel's book report on Harry Houdini. Yeah. <laughs> he does a tribute on how uh, Harry Houdini. Uh, and so I went to Mexico and got dragged by my ankles by a speeding boat. That's not even the full line. Okay. The full line is, if Houdini was alive, what would he do today? So I went to Mexico. It's like, that is not what Harry Houdini would do. If Harry Houdini was alive today, it would be like, let's go to Mexico. <laughs> he might be. You don't know no, that. I, no, I do know that. <laughs> I do know that he wouldn't do that. I bet. Wait a minute. Talking to Raymond. <laughs> Harry Houdini wouldn't do that. And, he doesn't like tequila. And I, I did crack up because I had many have likened Chris to Houdini. And then under it, my notes say, mostly Chris. Mm-hmm. And I always forget Houdini was jacked. Yes, yes, he had to be because he got punched in the abs all the time. Yeah, and the one time he didn't tense. It killed him. Uh, I love magic. When we go back to the main part of the show and go back live, Angel flips a peace sign to the camera, which is an interesting choice considering he nearly was just in a fist fight. (laughs) Yeah. And then uh, we meet Mike Super, our next person. (laughs) Mike Super, Uh, which, joke of the show. Yeah. Is that your real name? (laughs) It used to be Johnny Von Awesome, but I thought that was too on the nose. That's an amazing joke. He looks like a combination between Flex from Daisy of Love and independent wrestler Junie Underwood. Yes. Uh, He is going to uh, do a prediction-based trick. Uh, About an imaginary murder. About an imaginary murder. Uh, There's a box suspended above the stage with a lock on it. In that is a scroll. On that scroll, he has written down his prediction of what's about to happen here. And he throws frisbees into the crowd. Yeah. Uh, The first person grabs it and goes, okay, it's a fictional murder. You have to tell me what celebrity committed the murder. And they say Tom Hanks, because that is the first celebrity most people think of. Well, they actually, he does a really interesting setup. Oh, did I miss something? Yeah. He picks specific witnesses. Because he does Oh, it's not Frisbees. You're right. I'm sorry. He does like a little thing about Ted Bundy um, 
John Wayne Gacy and Charles Manson. So he asks for people named Ted, John, and Charlie yes. to stand up. And these are the people he asks. And Ross is his assistant. And Ross is the happiest man in the world right now. He's not Ross being like, tortured. Ross is like, I'm not getting stabbed. <laughs> There's no knives involved in this one. So he ends up with a John, a Ted, and a Charlie. Mm-hmm. Which you find suspicious. Suspicious. Okay. And uh, John first names a random object, and he names a dresser. Yes. That's the murder weapon, a dresser. Then Ted names Hawaii as the locale. Yes. And Ross visibly panics about the idea of having to spell Hawaii in front of national television. Mm -hmm. And a celebrity, Tom Hanks, is picked by Charlie. And then Ross picks the time of death. Yes. And picks 313. Uh, Mike also points out that he has stolen a bank deposit tube from a drive-thru. Yes. Which is kind of a like a charming, relatable anecdote. Yeah, that's also a thing I've super done, is accidentally take the tube with me. I don't think he accidentally took the tube with him. I think that was a yeah, I think calculated was choice. Mm-hmm. So he gets the suspect and the place right. And then the and time... And the murder weapon. And the weapon. And the time is a riddle. And he has the whole audience hold out their hands, puts up a black light, and everybody has 313 on their hands in black light ink. Yes. That's an awesome visual. Yes. Which is important for television, which is something that a lot of the magicians, mentalists, forgot to do. So my notes here, that's fun. He's a good showman. Uh, And Chris Angel goes... You were very entertaining, not like that last guy. Yeah, better than the previous act. So And Uri Geller does not like it. No, he does not. He I says it looks like a party trick. Yeah, I don't know why it bothers him so much, but it bothers him. Um, so let me ask you this. I, I'm guessing because you got a, a Wayne, a John, and a Charlie, you think everybody's a plant, right? Yeah. Okay. Because for there to be... A John, a Ted, and a Charlie in 2007 is statistically improbable. If I asked a room full of men, if everyone named John, Ted, or Charlie could stand up, uh, thank you, you would probably get more than one John. Yeah. You might not get a Ted at all. Theodore is not a terribly common name nowadays. Maybe a Charlie. Mm -hmm. A Chuck. But probably at least two of them would be John. So... Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to do a lot of research for the next time we sit down and record because all my big reveals are going to be in part one here. Ooh. Uh, so I said that I was playing Fool Us throughout this whole thing. Yeah. And for each trick, I was going to tell you how I think things were done. Yeah. I'm going to tell you exactly how this trick was done mm-hmm. because I've performed this trick. Ooh. I did this trick along with my buddy Chad Jaros, Magical Chad. At night of sex in college. The way we did it was we threw something in the crowd. That's why I guess I thought that. Yeah. And so yours actually seemed more random. And instead of it being a murder, it was like your perfect sexual encounter. Okay. So it was like, who did you have sex with and stuff like that. Uh, Chad, magical Chad, who hopefully is okay with the fact that I'm giving away how to do this trick. I wasn't going to, but it's actually going to be important later. Uh, trusted me to be his assistant for this. Basically, what happens, it's very simple. Through the thing in the crowd, we got the first piece of information. Backstage, we're writing down those random things on the scroll. Oh. And uh, they do a great job with this on television. Basically, the scroll is then rolled up, put in one of those tubes, and stored in a table that looks like it could not possibly hold the uh, scroll. The table just magically appears on stage in Phenomenon. Basically, they cut away, and they start talking, and when they cut back, suddenly there's a table on stage that wasn't there before. When we did this trick in college, I wheeled the table off. 
And like, I did like a sexy dance to be like distracting of like, don't pay attention to the fact that I'm bringing out this table. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's nothing in the box. There's no bottom to the box. When the box comes down, it attaches to the table. You open it up, you reach in, you pull out the scroll that we filled out backstage. Hey, all the information's correct. Unless you do it like we did it in college, where we couldn't hear the audience. So, <laughs> uh, the sexual encounter for some reason was taking place in a car. Uh, and basically it was, who are you having sex with? What type of car is it? And what color is the car? Okay. The uh, orange one. The orange one, yes. Uh, when I did it in college, the girl said, I'm having sex with Mike Skrenimakovich. It was like a name that, like, she didn't pick a celebrity. She just picked, like, this weird name. So we just put a bunch of letters down and a question mark. <laughs> uh, and then, in what color car uh, is it? She said green. Uh, and we wrote down green, except she said cream. Huh? Oh, no. So I wheeled out this thing full of answers that were all wrong and left Chad out there to die by himself. <laughs> so that's how I know exactly how this trick is done. Because you screwed it up real bad once? We screwed it up real bad. I have no idea how he did the hand things. The obvious answer is it was just planned ahead of time. Ross was told to say 313 and they stamped it on everybody's hands. Like, that's the only thing that makes sense. The only other way I could see it possibly working is if he had an accomplice when they handed out the matchboxes for the other tricks. Mm -hmm. If someone was, like, pressing a stamp on their hands. Like, maybe there's hand... Because it's the palm of their hands. Maybe it was a handshake or something. But... Was it the front or was it the it back was the of, their front hands? of their hands? Oh, because my thought originally was that it was the back... I, I, for some reason, thought it was the back of their hands and that it was, like, a hand stamp. Yeah, for for it to be legitimate, though, you have to sneakily stamp the hands of every audience member. Yeah. And that's the only way I could think maybe you could do it, is if you did it with, like, a handshake. Yeah, I thought the back of the hand made sense because uh, you take your ticket, you get your hand stamped. Yeah. In case you had to go to the bathroom or something. So, that's how that trick was done. Uh, sorry, Chad. I love you. <laughs> And this is another one of the, like, issues with this show. America has to vote. So the show always just kind of ends. Abruptly, yeah. Like, because, well, it's over. Because they don't do an elimination at the end. Yeah. Like, I think it would have been much wiser to do the eliminations at the end of the show. Yes. Rather than st at the start of the show. Um, and I should bring this up because we haven't brought it up yet. It ends every episode with the host going, uh, consider this, is the impossible possible? possible? And the answer is no. That's what the word impossible means. <laughs> like, that's like saying, imagine this, is wetness dry? No, they're the op they're opposite words. <laughs> How did that become the sign-off? How many people worked on this show <laughs> that, that that was the best they could come up with? It's the impulsible. Impulsible. Big you tried energy. So that's episode two. Big you didn't try energy. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the end of episode two. Episode two, I do feel like this was kind of six episodes uh, crammed into five because this one did seem significantly longer than every other episode. Yeah, it's it was a Halloween special, so it ran very long. Which also, what a terrible thing to do to this show. To make your second episode a Halloween special where people aren't really watching TV. I think... This is just me kind of spitballing. I think they put the more memorable mentalists... On the second episode. Because the second episode was... The tricks were better and more interesting. And I think that that was maybe an intentional... 
I don't know about your Halloween, but I know like we went back to the house at the end and like you traded your candy and that was usually about eight o'clock ish that eight to 10 time slot. If this aired on a weeknight, which it did. Mm -hmm. Halloween's over pretty early on a weeknight. If now Halloween's a Friday night or a Saturday night, give up. But being a kid, Halloween was like over by 9 p.m. Right. So my, your parents be home. We would always just like have something on the TV. And I could see this being spooky enough to have on because you were at the mercy of TV back then. You didn't really have like yeah. Netflix. I don't know if this show is for kids. I think it would be more towards the group of people that would more likely be at a party. Not post-trick-or-treating. How many weeknight Halloween parties have you ever been to Um, as a real adult? I'm pretty sure I was at a party and taped this. (laughs) Okay. What year was this? 2007. What were you doing in 2007? Partying. (laughs) What age group were you in 2007? I was in high school. No, you weren't. Was I not? 2007? You're right, I wasn't. I was in college. College kids do not have the same (laughs) rules as adults. How many times since being post-college have you gone to a party on Halloween if Halloween was a weekday? Okay. (laughs) Like, that's a night adults tend to be home. There's not really much going on. You're getting up to give out candy. You're not really following a plot. This actually is... Kind of a good show to have on if you're going to get up and give out candy because you're not really following it. So then I ask you this. Yeah. The people on episode one had a very different experience from those on episode two. Right. Do you think you had an equal chance of moving on depending on what show you were on? Because it's still 50% get eliminated, but it's still six versus four. I think... I don't know. I'd have to look at the actual ratings to see, like, whether episode two did better than episode one. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't even considered, like, do you have a better chance of winning the whole series if you're on tour? Ratings were much poorer in the second week. Not because it was Halloween. They never really bounce back. It's just... The show's bad. (laughs) Yeah. um, They're at about 8.3 million viewers. On week one, and just under six million for week two. Okay. And then they they go back up to just over six million. For the remainder of the run, they're actually really consistent. It's 6.1, 6.16, 6.17 for subsequent weeks, which is actually, to be fair, pretty reasonable hold. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting. I, the, the question I'm more of asking is, since you're only competing against three magicians, mentalists, on night one and five on night two, is it fair? Because, like, you get more of a spotlight if you're on the first episode. And, like, there's less people that they could vote for besides you. And then there's a larger pack on night two. Like I think it's easier night one because there are only three of you. More people were watching. Yeah. It's it's asymmetrical, and I'm sure everyone that was eliminated felt felt like they should have been on the other night. <laughs> yeah. But that's gonna do it for the first half of Phenomenal. Well my god, four of them were from Pennsylvania. That's what I was saying. You said like a lot of them? I wasn't expecting it to be a full forty percent. I mean a lot is the most it could be before I would say half. Yeah. And Angela's from Ohio and Jerry's from New York. So like just that. East Coast magic. East Coast magic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I just. Um, I do think having it on Halloween was an interesting choice, but I don't think it was necessarily a bad choice. Okay. 
So that's going to do it for the first half of Phenomenon. Uh, let us know if you're having a good time. Uh, you can watch the other remaining episodes if you want to join in the links below. And while you're down there, you'll see a link to our new public Discord. So if you want to chat with us about the show and all plus two comedy projects, you can join that Discord and you can chat us up there. Where can people find us? You can email us at the Stay Doomed Show at gmail.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Stay Doomed. And if you want to talk to me about magic tricks that went wrong, I'm at Plus Two Comedy on Twitter and TV's Noah on Instagram. If you want to talk about the timing of Halloween specials and whether you watched TV on Halloween night as a kid or not, or as an adult, I'm at Priorities on Twitter and Glitter and Glow Tape on Instagram. Until next time, stay doomed.